her energy was raw, an aura that had no use for hesitation. Truck won't start, her voice boomed, working against the slack support of her office chair. Marga pulled herself erect. She fully focused on the woman standing before her. Nothing about the stranger with the rocket launcher voice looking down at her was subtle. Not even the long gray hair bundled about her head. Mary was used to the mixture of curiosity and offense that slid over Margot's face as she held her neck back in an awkward tilt that exposed her soft throat. From her vantage point, Mary detected Margot's quickened swallow, tasted her advantage, and waited. Good morning, madam. Welcome. How are you today? Margot's bright voice did not warm Mary's blue eyes. Instead, she doubled the iciness. I'm mad, but it's not your fault. Ornery. Let me tell you, this woman claimed the adjective like the hillbilly she has been called all her life. Rewinding the incident, Margot realized that she had missed an early warning of the rupturing of her peace that day. As she later vented to her girlfriend, two minutes before Mary appeared at the desk, the woman's husband, a Vietnam vet, tried to signal to me that something was about to go down. Didn't work. Margot was driving on the slow lane like Sunday morning. With two hours before her next scheduled appointment, she had let down her guard. In quick time, she knew her practice routine for walking customers was not the tool for this situation. The Hermatin, with a last name that rhymed with Dunnigan, was not an everyday walk-in. She was not the kind to expect answers from someone sitting behind a desk. Her issues were not the kind easily fixed. Before she stormed in, Margot's brief exchange with a taciturn, 80-ish looking year old man almost was as solid as ether. He mumbled something that sounded like, she's coming. Trained to make eye contact with any and all potential clients, the tax preparer wasn't even entirely sure that the indistinct sound that reached her was directed at her. Best to nod and smile and be done. He shuffled past her. His stiff legs ambled with the help of a blunt walking cane. Now he was back standing before her desk beside Mary. Her eyes switched slowly between Mr. and Mrs. Dream Team. Her next customers. The sudden release of acid in her stomach was warning enough. In her line of work, she had learned to trust the intelligence of her body. It was itself significant that Mary's husband had made it inside the center ahead of her. Chalk it up to his survival instincts. It took no particular insight to guess that in their 55 year long union, he may have died a thousand times had he not known how to sidestep danger. Why else would an army man socialize in an era of machismo, leave his wife to deal with a smoking vehicle engine on her own? Among the many secrets to marital longevity, the ability to step nimbly out of the line of fire may be the golden rule. Of course, Margot knew better than to discount the existence of the glue of romance of a sort. 
Case in point was the rare moment of Mary's vulnerability when she spoke about looking forward to their June wedding anniversary. That was two months away. Two months in Margot's line of business could appear a lifetime. She doubted very much that hubby heard the sentimentality of the missus over the upcoming anniversary of the blessed nuptials. He was too busy pouring his whole self into a conversation with a passerby. The need to disengage from the Helion sitting beside him was impossible to miss and gave Margot the discomfort of a voyeur's. Margot was at first amused over his pretense to not having heard his wife ask for his date of birth information that Mary needed to complete the paperwork for the transaction at hand. There was no doubt her leadership in all matters. Margot's amusement quickly changed to sympathy as she witnessed the two hard jabs Mary delivered into the soft flesh of her husband's size 60 waist. The assault was effective. He produced the date his tight squeeze on the roughly carved head of his walking stick was a visual scream that curdled Margot's blood. She knew it was time to settle on a strategy. Her best plan was to nimble around the tough edges of the missus with inquiries she thought were most likely to elicit sunnier responses. Gently, she probed on the subject of Mary's adult daughter, the only one of her three children she seemed willing to speak about. Margot also asked after the plans for the upcoming wedding anniversary. The diversion worked for a short bit. The acid buildup in her gut told her it was fated to fail. By her own telling, Mary's life was no bed of roses. Her mother died when she was just 15 years old. The tragedy immediately transformed her into a surrogate mother to five brothers and sisters. Thereafter, the list of hardships a loveless Mary survived drove her to seek shelter under the big tents of pastors who troll human hardship for power. Stories of Mary's multiple surgeries, the Vietnam draft, the awkward welcome home received by her injured husband and other veterans of that disreputable war was the early chapter. Later came the necessary participation in the workforce past passion or energy, and a lifetime of minimum wage jobs in the garment sector. Mary's recall of disappointment filled the hour at the spear desk she set up for one of the most important obligations of most citizens. Margot knew there was more, much more, had there been time past corporate's careful allocated hour for filing. Hardship had taken hold of a woman who, in another life, may have been a perfect Irish rose. That possibility was gone. In its place, was a woman scarred by life. Then, as if there was never a bottom, on top of all the mess she had survived, she now owed taxes. Mary was required to sign three times on the obnoxious papers, attesting a miserly but unconscionable indebtedness. Three times she threw the offensive pen at Margot, each time. 
She returned the pen with a, I'm sorry. For each apology, Mary roared, Shut up! Hubby's face spoke of his pain for each of us, involuntary partners. Then he chose. His Mary had no intention of going peacefully into another night. Instead of mailing the voucher with payment owed, the hillbilly Martin declared, I'll mail a bomb! Her husband of 55 years cast a loving look upon her hardened jaw and with a sardonic smile added, Well, lace the envelope with anthrax.